Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another Jimbo's driveway. Today, we're gonna to be spending some time with the gorgeous Alfa Romeo 159 Sport Wagon that I have here next to me. Now, just very quickly, before we get started, you will remember that in my last video, I was telling you that this was in the garage because when I took it for a, a, a drive to caffeine the machine a few weeks ago, which was you know a good outing for the car, it developed a squeak on the front end of the suspension. Subsequently, having had it in the garage, have the mechanics have a real good look, good look around it. Um, it's perfectly safe. And in fact, it looks like hardly anything is worn or really needs replacing. And even the squeak that did appear seems to have somehow resolved itself and is almost non-existent. So what I've been advised is it's perfectly safe to use. If it does squeak occasionally, it really doesn't warrant all the expense of taking apart the front suspension to replace things which I've been told may not even solve the problem anyway. That aside, um, let's get on, have a look around the car, tell you a bit about the Alpha 159, and also about this car now being 11 years old. We can look at how, how well a car like this wears and um, dig into that a little bit. We'll take it out for a drive, see what it's like out on the road, and hopefully do a half decent review of this car. Well, I think there's no denying that the Alpha 159 is a gorgeous looking car. Um, Alphas are often renowned for, for their good looks, um, as are many of their Italian counterparts. If not, sometimes their, uh, uh, their reliability and durability, but we're not gonna go down that path just yet. Just look at this gorgeous face. This car's originally came out in 2005. It was launched at the 2005 Geneva Motor Show. Um, so some 16 years ago from now, and yet this design, it still looks gorgeous today, and I'm sure it will age very well over time. This, as you go along the side of the car, it's got the, uh, these kind of slightly flared arches, um, and it, it really sort of like brings the shape of the car uh, together. You know, it's just a fantastic, a fantastic design. It was originally launched in saloon version, um, this is actually the uh, sport wagon version or the estate version that followed in 2006. This is the TI specification of the Alpha 159. Um, that's about as top as the tree as it comes when uh, you was you were specking up this car. It means it came with the 19 inch uh, alloy wheels, um, the I think these uh, the, the silver wing mirrors. Um, it came with a lovely perforated leather interior that we'll have a closer look at when we get inside the car, um, as well as a slightly lowered suspension, which gives, gives it a, a, great, a great stance, great look straight from the factory. These indicators, the shape of them are just, are just lovely. Some, some time's really been spent on those sorts of things. This uh, clover leaf is uh, re representative of the, the quadrifolio, uh, brand. I don't think this is a quadrifolio car in any shape. That That is safe for the very most uh, sporting of Alfa Romeo's. I think that was added by a previous owner. A nice little touch nonetheless. You can see the badge down here on the wing is uh, from Gijaro. Gijaro was a designer that worked alongside Alfa uh, to design this car and he is uh, famed for working with just about every manufacturer you can think of. He, he also had a hand in the Lotus Esprit Series 1, which is one of my favorite uh, cars of all time, which you might uh, most famously from the Bond movies, if you're a Bond fan like me. The engine in this car is the 2.4 five-cylinder, 20-valve turbo diesel. This was classed as a sporting diesel. Now, the sporting diesel seems to be a thing that's kind of come and gone now. I think with the changes in, in emissions and so much looking towards electrification of vehicles, the diesel is gonna find itself probably sort of like at, at, at the back end, certainly not appearing in, in what are considered sporty models. However, I actually think and this might be a bit controversial, that this specification is actually the pick of the bunch. I'll come back to that when we go out for a drive. But the automatic gearbox in this um, is a prerequisite of Mrs. Jimbo. She'll only drive automatic cars, and predominantly this is gonna be her car to drive day to day. So that was a given. 
the 3.2 petrol engine, the V6, as lovely as it is, it's just too thirsty to live with on a day-to-day -day basis. So this car being 11 years old, uh, we do have to consider what the overall condition is like. It does seem to have had a number of owners, which, uh, I don't know, you know, the, the history seems to suggest that people have had it, spent a few thousand pounds on it, and then sold it. Let's hope that's a trend I'm gonna change. But anyway, the exterior is in remarkable condition. These are known for having subframes that rust. This one's been fully checked out. The previous owner was a real alpha nut himself. Uh, so this followed ownership of a Brera. Um, he owned this for a while while he had a young family. He's now moved on to a Julia. So the guy that I bought this from really knows his alphas. And I think as a general point, if you buy one of these sorts of cars, you really want to buy it from a private seller. The wheels could do with a refurb, but they're not too bad, so I'm gonna leave them be for the time being. Um, now, other than that, this is a very, very sound car and in very good, uh, very good overall condition. This being the estate version, um, it, it has uh, the, the tailgate and plenty of space inside, as can be demonstrated. Um, it is, as you can see here, it's got plenty, uh, it's got, got half a dozen chairs inside it, no problem at all. Um, boot space is adequate. Inside the cockpit of the car, it's, it's a really nice place to be. It feels, it feels spacious. Uh, it's quite dark, but I think that's just because of the spec of this car with, with the dark headlining and the, and the dark seats, etc. Um, lovely leather, perforated seats, leather on, on the door, um, all electric, everything. This one doesn't have the electric seats, doesn't have the electric mirrors. However, I do have a set of uh, the electric mirrors and all the gubbins that goes with it. If I wanted to convert to have the electric folding mirrors, um, that's the only thing it doesn't have. I've got loads of, um, I think this is aluminium, I think this is brushed aluminium, uh, the center console. Um, the gear gator thing isn't the greatest quality, it's a bit horrible. It's probably the one thing that lets it down in here is that um, we've got this aftermarket Pioneer head unit, which to begin with would only receive radio two, three, or four. Um, and that's about it. And now seems to have given up the ghost completely. Uh, it is wired into an aftermarket rear camera. Um, I've never really gone with rear cameras. Um, Mrs. Jimbo is, is getting to grips with and finds it quite handy now. So this is possibly gonna be replaced with some sort of Apple CarPlay head unit at some point in the future. Uh, for now, we're just gonna have to talk to each other if we're out in the in the car together, I suppose. Um, the dual climate control works works very well. It's very efficient at keeping us very cool in here and very quietly as well. Um, we did have a particularly hot day the other day. We had it running full blast. It just seemed, it seemed to struggle a little bit in, in, in that heat. Um, but, you know, generally very, very adequate at uh, keeping a, a nice steady temperature and not being too noisy with it either. Really, the, build, the build quality is actually better than I thought it was going to be. It's far more solid in here and you get the reassuring thud noise through the suspension as you travel over the bumps. Um, it's not crashy at all. It feels like very well engineered and good quality space. And considering this car is 12 years old, um, it doesn't really feel it driving around at all lovely and tight and the interior is still in, in great condition for its age on the road. Now I've had this car for um, about a month now. Um, I've been driving it as much as I could so I could get a good feel of the car and talk about the car as um, accurately as I can. Um, Mrs Jimbo has also been driving the car. Um, her initial thoughts were that it was too big and she she wasn't too keen after a little one series. She thought that was much better for, for driving around town. Uh, which is predominantly what her driving is. Um, and I, I have to say, to some degree, I do agree with her. This isn't a natural city car, I wouldn't say. I mean, it's, it's happy enough driving around town. This car is much more at home on munching the motorway miles, doing, doing longer trips. When we took it to a Caffeine and Machine a few weeks ago, that's about 150 miles each way. Um, mainly mainly motorway miles and it soaked that up absolutely no problem at all um, the other thing I should say in terms of 
dri drivability of the car, when you're driving it around town, it feels a little bit laboured to get moving. It's like you really have to get some, some energy moving within all the components before, before the car really feels comfortable. The gearbox at low speeds feels a little a little bit clunky and you can feel it but again once you get moving once you get up to sort of normal road speeds um and certainly on some dual carriage rails and motorway gearbox feels absolutely lovely and it pulls fantastically um like i, like I said earlier this uh, car's got uh, a few modifications now those are mainly centered around the fact that the last owner had to do some reasonably serious uh, work on the car, which included replacing the cylinder head. Uh, one of the ailments that does bother the, the 159 in particular, this engine I should say, um, is the, they, they can, the, the cylinder heads can crack apparently. So I've heard and I've only learned about this since having this car, but apparently that is something that can happen and it did happen. Um, to the last previous uh, to the previous owner um, so he had the he had the, the cylinder head replaced with a, with a refurbished unit and then while doing that having all the intake apart he had the swell flaps deleted the EGR deleted which are other areas which can affect this car this car when you start it up it's really noisy like I know it's a diesel and everything else but it's really noisy At low revs around town, and particularly when it's um, when it's cold, it's uh, it sounds really noisy. Uh, to the point, I, I did wonder whether there was something wrong with it, but I'm sure there isn't. Now I don't know if that's because that's because, uh, because the the swell flap and EGR delete. I don't know whether the extra sort of intake noise, everything you hear, is um, is, is due to that. But in any case, this car it's not. The, it's not the quietest or most refined thing at uh, low speeds uh, around town or certainly when it's slow. However, like I say, get it out on some open roads, particularly to get it on some uh, get it on some motorway, and it's an absolutely lovely car to drive. You learn this through through my own research buying this car, um, but the Alpha 159 was actually it's quite a bit bigger than the 156 that it followed. It's also quite a bit heavier too, and it does, you can feel that weight. It's about 1,600 kilos curb weight, I think. Heavy, uh, good and reliable are not necessarily two things you find in a car, but it does feel a bit heavy, but I think it does feel solid. It does feel like a good, solid uh, executive car, which is what Alpha were intending when they launched the 159. Um, I always thought it was more of a contender for the, the sort of three series, uh, size car but in fact the 159 being a bit bigger and was a bit engineered a bit further than, than the 156 to actually be more in the marketplace and sit alongside uh, e-class mercedes and 5 series bmws i have had a 5 series uh, a 5 series of a similar uh, age to this an e61 model and um i can see i can see similarities it feels it feels like a, it feels like an equally good car inside, like equally comfortable to ride, uh, equally quiet. It, feel, it feels refined, more so than I was expecting for, from from an Alpha, which I thought was going to be more of a sporty, slightly more Spartan, um, like harsher ride. But actually, that's that, that's not the case at all with this car. So the drivetrain in this car is it's a front wheel drive setup, which is certainly from the purest point of view. Um, probably a bit of a uh, a bit of a sore subject because the Julia has got a front engine rear wheel drive setup. This has got front engine front front wheel drive setup, and it has always seemed it's always seemed to be a bit of a a bit of a down a bit of a letdown. Um, considering the competition, this was supposed to be going up against. We we're talking five series E E class Mercedes. You know they've both got front engine rear wheel drive. Uh, Jaguar XF as well, front engine rear wheel drive. So this having a front wheel drive setup does set it back a bit from 
its competition of the time. What I would say is that, again, coming back to the point about it's, it's an everyday usable car, it doesn't really feel overcompromised at all. Certainly when you put your foot down away from the junction, reasonably enthusiastically, you can sort of tell it's a front wheel drive car, but you're soon gonna forget about that when you're underway because it makes little to no difference when you're doing sort of like general driving and when you're kind of cruising. So I don't think that it really makes a big difference in the grand scheme of things. I know if you're a purist, you'd love this to have rear wheel drive and it would make it a, you know, a far more desirable car just for that reason. But I think in real terms, I don't think it makes a fantastic amount of, of difference. Alongside that, the gearbox and the transmission is quite, has a limited slip differential. So uh, that comes as a standard in this specification. So it's, although there is a bit of torque steer when you're accelerating, uh, it does feel well firmly planted and the grip is there, which is, which is great. The gearbox on this particular model is the five-speed automatic Qtronic, and these gearboxes, on on reliably told, are, are are absolutely great. They're fine. I read a lot about gearbox issues in Alpha 159s before, and this seems to be, I believe, more to do with a manual gearbox, which is found on the 2.2 diesel and the 1.9 petrol, etc. Basically, I think all of the other cars that use a manual gearbox. Um, have uh, have problems, and those problems, I, I'm told, arise out of the fact that it's a, it's a Vauxhall gearbox, and it can't it can't really cope with the with, with the power or the torque distribution that the these engines put out, and so it just fails. Which can't, which brings me back to when earlier on I was saying, I think this is probably the best pick of the bunch. That's one of the reasons why. You want to kind of limit, wherever you can, buying anything that's going to give you too much grief. Yes, it's a 10-year-old car. Yes, it's got 95,000 miles on it. Yes, you expect that it's going to need some things doing. But at the same time, you want to kind of minimise that as best you can. So if you're looking for something that's going to hopefully keep the cost down a bit, don't buy the car with the known dodgy gearbox. Buy the one with the decent gearbox. Yeah, the, the automatic gearbox actually makes a lot more sense on the talkier diesel cars, because it will pull you through the gears as it needs to really quickly, and you won't be thinking, oh, I'm out of puff again, I've got to change gear. And that is why I think that this two, this 2.4 diesel, with the remap and the other bits, pulling about 230 horsepower, sitting, just, sitting next in line to the 3.2 petrol variant, is the is the one to go for it's the one to go for like i say back in the day that obviously wasn't choice because when i went to buy this car there was only six cars in this specification we're out on some of the b roads now and we can open the car up a little bit and it really does go there is absolutely no worries about hustling this car along um, you put your foot down and it goes and because it's got that talky diesel it will pull right from low revs all the way around to the 5000 limit on this um, and it absolutely pulls like a train for want of a better phrase I don't like that phrase much it's overused but it really does it goes really well pulling comparisons back to the 5 series I used to have that had that was completely standard that car that had uh, around 270 brake horsepower. This feels like no slouch. I mean, that really, that really did feel like it had some punch, especially on the motorway in the mid-range. This car doesn't feel like it's lacking at all. In acceleration or mid-range, there's really, really nothing to complain about here. The brakes on this are fantastic. It's got 320 mil discs at the front with six pot Brembo calipers. And the fact that they're painted red means they're even better. Uh, the pedal's got a, a nice progressive feel to it um, and when you really have to slam on the anchors the thing really does stop in a hurry. It's got a really nice layout with these dials, um, that's been thought through but then because they're kind of sunk back the ones in the middle of the dash and the ones in the binnacle, um, they're set back and they're a bit like in the shadows 
at night when it's illuminated it looks fantastic and they work really well but in the daytime it's a bit of a struggle to see the numbers on the dials yet then right smack bang in the middle of that you've got this bright red display which doesn't seem to matter whether you turn it up or down it makes no effect to the other numbers it's just like that's brighter red in your fa my face or not it's just a bit of an odd quirk I suppose and while we're on the subject of that uh, of those sort of like weird quirks the window washers are rubbish they're ridiculous they do a good job at either spraying the roof of the car uh, on this one or spraying the very bottom of the windscreen I know it could be adjusted but they're really tucked away under the bonnet I don't know how easy they're going to be to to adjust but I think even if they were working well they're not that effective this is one thing a little thing about the Saab Saab are very well engineered they've got three washers at front and when you put the jets on you really do get a clear windscreen this feels a little bit like hard work just like they were just a bit of an afterthought really I know to some people that's going to seem like a really like minor point about about those but you know I think it's, it's quite important it all adds to the driving experience and the uh, and the ownership experience as well let's do some summing up then of the Alpha 159 Sportwagon I've got to say I'm having lived with it now for a few months both myself and Mrs Jimbo are very happy with the car um, despite the fact that we thought we was going to have a, a, an immediate headache on our hands that turned out not to be the case and from a driving point of view um, she's got used to it she likes she's quite happy driving it around town and doing what she wants to do with it and uh, having taken it out on a few runs I'm also you know really really happy with this car um, if I'm being picky the things that I don't like about it so much is uh, the the dash is a little bit difficult to read like I said um, it's a bit of a shame that you can't really read much of what's going on on the dials unless it's night time um, the indicators seem to have a mind of their own uh, drive me drive me drive me a bit crazy and the, and the washer jets also seem just rubbish which uh, seems like a trivial point but uh, I like to have a good squirt in the morning and um, it's just not possible in this car it's very very competent uh, at munching up long distances uh, and, and, and feels like the sort of car you, that's got plenty of life left in it which is uh, which is a good point we hope because the longer term plan for this car is hopefully to keep it for the next couple of years we'll see what transpires um, over over that course of, of time and see if there are any kind of major sort of like scares or, or problems uh, that, that crop up but let's let's hope uh, that isn't the case I think that if you wanted to buy one of these cars you would do it on the basis that uh, you accept that you, there is there is, there is going to be some, uh, some some things you're going to have to address over time particularly maybe around sort of like suspension stuff like that uh, gearboxes if you've got one of the other gearboxes um, cylinder heads maybe you know they're, they're the big things you've got concern and subframes as well but if you do your research before buying the car you, you you get that checked out as well as you can you're gonna give yourself the best opportunity to not buy a lemon dead certainly by having an Alpha 159 is gonna set you apart from the the uh, Blando Deutsche Wagon crowd in their BMWs and, and uh, Mercedes and the like and you've actually can have something that's really a bit different to drive far more unique it's got a bit of character on the inside uh, and also has a bit of character to drive as well so that's just about all for today I hope you've enjoyed this video on the Alpha 159 Sportwagon if you have um, really appreciate it if you like the video subscribe to the channel and please share because that really helps to the channel grow and I've got lots more exciting things in the pipeline that I'm hopefully going to be sharing with you very soon so that's all for today take care for now and I will be seeing you again very soon bye bye